Faisal, you mentioned the three domain kingdom. I think we'd all like to hear a little bit more about that. Okay. Yes. Uh, I try to simplify something that's so complex. I hope uh, people take it with a grain of honey or salt. It depends. Um, uh, the idea, I, sometimes I like to call this, this view uh, the greatest story never told. I wish, I wish at least I heard it. Maybe it's told, but I didn't hear it. Mm -hmm. I wish it was told in a way that could uh, explain some of these complexities that is here. So I tried to simplify, you know, those years and years of looking and seeking and guidance uh, in a way that I found it, to me, it makes some sense. I hope it makes sense to the editor. I believe we exist, we live in a kingdom, one kingdom, one holistic kingdom, divided in three realms. And those three realms are not separate. They are subtler realms, you know, one gross realm, one intermediate realm, one very subtle realm. And those realms interweave into each other, you know. But most of the time, we don't perceive, you know, how they are interwoven, and we perceive the product, you know. It's just like now we're looking at the computer, but we don't see the mechanism of the computer. We don't see the frequency that are coming from the transmission of the station or the satellite that's bringing it, you know. All of this coexisting now in order for this interview to happen, for the, you know, for the audience to watch, you know. So we are so much uh, now focusing on the manifestation, the realm of the manifestation, and we are so um, fascinated and entangled and limited by it that we miss on perceiving the subtler uh, domains that are passing through it, you know? Um, the closest, I try to give some example to, to bring the idea closer to the, uh, to understanding. Uh, if you if you think of the lotus flower, you know, the lotus flower is, is a beautiful flower. Its roots are rooted in the mud of a lake or a pond or a river, and the stem uh, you know, grows in the water, and the lotus itself is out in space and air and uh, uh, sunlight and you name it, you know. Uh, we can think of the petals, the flower itself, as the manifested realm. Okay. This is one realm. And the stem as the deeper, subtler realm, that is the second realm, which I call the essential realm. You know? And then the deeper realm is where the roots are rooted, which is the mud state. This is the pure being realm, basic ground. That's the absolute. So we have a kingdom the foundation of which, the source of which is the absolute. The absolute is manifesting itself or is, is being manifested as different frequencies. If we think the absolute is the highest possible frequency, you know, the essential domain is beginning of the activation of those frequencies, of the highest frequency and a much more, a um, little bit gross frequencies, you know, like frequencies of light or frequencies of um, essential substances, divine substances that can be perceived through direct experience or direct perception, but cannot be seen directly by the, our regular senses. Mm. Then these frequencies gel even more, and the product of it is this realm that we see. You know, the trees, the planets, the, all of that. This is the same frequencies, this is the same as the absolute, condensed. It's just like water, and water becomes steam, vapor, becomes a mist, becomes a cloud, becomes rain, becomes ice, you know, snow. Um, it's the same mediumship manifesting into in different manifestation and frequencies. So there is the absolute condensed into essential state. I don't know the mechanism. Someday I think the science will find the mechanism. It's a form of compression. This compression 
produces substances, essential uh, frequencies, and then the essential frequencies are congealed into physical phenomena. These are the three domain of this kingdom. The absolute pure beingness, essential domain, and worldly manifestation. These are the three realms of reality. Those three realms constitute one kingdom. You know, just because we don't see it, we have even divided it. The, the realm of the spirit is somewhere else. The hereafter is somewhere else. You know, We don't even listen to what we say. We say the here, after. We don't question the here and what's the after. After what? And the here, where, you know? And the Christ says, the kingdom of heaven, you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand. Here it is, you know? And a friend of mine said, paradise, which we all aspire to reach, and you know, is where, he, if you take the word paradise, here is it, parade, eyes. Where the eyes parade, you know? Mm. So the kingdom of heaven is here. This is the most magical manifestation of this holistic kingdom, this incredible kingdom that we live in, that we hear uh, different beings, different uh, uh, seers or realizers told us about it, but it's never been defined. I think with the help of the science now, we can define it even more. It's source with different frequencies and the different frequencies gels at different as different phenomena. This three domain kingdom pertains to each domain variety of laws and rules and regulations and manifestations. You know? And a great deal of the mess that happened, especially in the spiritual kingdom spiritual uh, teaching is that teaching that have that apply to one domain were asked to to apply to all the domains you know and that created confusion mm. because certain teachings apply to one domain differ from teachings apply to the other domain and sometimes they are even contradictory what you need to do in the spiritual domain, you need to do the opposite in the material domain. You know? And they are not contradictory. It's just they are different manifestation and different laws you know, that can be seen. So what happened is that, for example, some of the spiritual people who had realized the basic nature applied the, the rules or the laws of the basic nature to the material realm and it caused so many uh, misunderstanding and so much trouble to students because they had started created conflicts within within them. So I will go about these different domains with what pertain them in a very simplistic manner, you know, that that might not be fair, but I I'll try to do it. Let's say there's three domains. There that we have three kind of selves, you know, pertaining to these three domains. To the worldly domain, we have what we call an ego self. A self that is made of the product of being in this room, from parenting, from our parents, from our schools, from our, you know, whatever, from also our spirit trying to cope and uh, navigate in this realm. So there is a self, but this self is not quite a, a, a real self. It is a, a made-up self, a self depending on the situation. You know? And a self that's made in Africa is different from the self made in China, is different from the self made in America. <coughs> <coughs> but we have certain agreement on certain things and that makes up some kind of functioning healthy ego that we can communicate and cope with each other and do all of those things. Personality, identities, character structures. Yes, yeah. all of that is this is the self pertaining to, to this worldly realm. Uh, in the essential realm, in the subtler realm, the realm of 
dom uh, essen essences of light of different frequencies there is another self this self is made of elements that are not concept and ideas and images and belief systems that's the personality but this one is made of elements that are truly precious you know it's made of light essential light not necessarily physical light but a different frequency of light subtler than the physical light and it's made of those lights are condensed in different uh, forms like diamonds, pearl, jewels. Often you see it in, in, in paintings, in Tibetan paintings, you know, and you see like um, Tara or Ablakatishvara or Buddha or beautiful deities wearing crown jewel and wearing necklaces and wearing robes. And these are, this, th these are the element from which this self is made of. Each aspect of those elements is a form of knowledge, is a, is a manifest, is a form of uh, feeling, knowing, being. You know, so this this entity is a living entity. It is not like the ego. The ego is not alive. The ego is uh, just frequency in the mind. You know, but this this entity is a living being that can move through the three realms. This entity can manifest in the worldly realm, even though it's not, it may not be perceived. Many psychic talks about they see in this inner being and this shining star. And, you, you know, I, I, I've met some Sufis in Iran. They, t they tell me about their astral traveling and they go from one place to another and doing so many hectic things and miraculous things. I, I talked about some of those points. The, this the self is, I call it the point of light. And this self is, uh, I talked about it uh, in some stories from the hidden realm, encountering with some of those remarkable or beautiful points of light, or what happened to that point of light. You know, for a seer, for a sensor, you can perceive this entity. You can literally see a person in full glory. Like Christ, with, not Christ on the cross, but Christ wearing the crowns and the jewels and all of those things, or the Mary wearing the robe of glory and the crown and or, or, beautiful entities. Um, the, when you see them, as I explained before, you know why the human race is a narcissist. We are all fallen in love like narcissists looking in the pond, seeing his image. We fell in love with the image and we're forgetting that the image pertains to something real. So the ego, the narcissistic part of the ego, the most vain part of the ego is a memory, is a photo of this beautiful entity. You know, this entity exists since we cannot see it. We are holding its picture and saying, here it is, you know, I am something special. So this being can exist in the relative, can exist in the essential domain, can also exist in the absolute pure beingness. It can move in any of those realms. Its highest functioning that I know, its highest purpose, is that it has one foot in the relative and one foot in the absolute, and it's weaving the two realms. It's the unifier of the two realms. It's the creator. It takes something from the worldly realm, delegated to the higher realm of understanding, of wisdom, of love, understanding the difficulty, the meaning, and finding a resolution and bringing it back, or bringing aspiration, um, knowledge, wisdom, love, to the worldly realm and correcting the offness that we are in. So this, this being is the being that has the two uh, accessibility to the, the three realms, the, especially the relative and the absolute. And they say the definition of the perfect human being is the one who reached that station, who reached that position. One foot in the relative, one foot in the absolute, and constantly harmonizing and creating something elegant, sophisticated, meaningful, that leads to the evolution of this totality of this kingdom. This self is eternal, it doesn't die, the body dies, but it continues. 
often it's seen as the, the one that incarnates. And whatever the soul accumulates in this lifetime uh, comes back with it. When it leaves, it goes back with it. When a soul leaves, it doesn't leave its uh, virtues or karma behind. The soul takes that with it, or negative karma can even surround that point of light and can even trap it in the hidden realm mm -hmm. and can, in fact, force it to be born in a, in the realm, in a lower realm than it was before if the karma was very bad. You know? So the holy laws govern the self. So even though the self is God or the creator, you know, within, it's also ruled by certain laws. So it doesn't, you know, th there is fairness and there is justice and there is balance because we are dealing with a kingdom that we need to honor its limitation and function within its limitation mm -hmm. in order to um, optimize it, in order to evolve it. Then the third self is the common spiritual self that <laughs> all the spiritualists talk about as self with capital S, you know. To me, that is not self, that is selfhood. That's the pure essence of self. Self indicate individuality, uniqueness, all of those things. While selfhood ind indicates the basic nature from which everything is made. And when I am experiencing the absolute, I don't experience me as a unique individual person. I experience me as a presence, as a pure awareness, no individuality, no, no uniqueness, no difference, but I am not gone. No, nor am I individuated. I am just an awareness that is here, that sensing, that you know, uh, experiencing the, the the presence itself. And with it, there is a sense of me, but it's not this facial that I know. It's the pure presence of facialness. You know what <laughs> that means. You know? mm -hmm. So it is uh, <coughs> when you feel it, it feels it has a sense of self. That's why they call it the bigger self, because it's the self of everything. But to me, it's, that's the selfhood. Maybe it's a matter of language. It's the selfhood. It's the basic element of self that exists in all. You know, the rock has it. The animal has it. The human has it. But the human has a unique identity, uniqueness. You know? In fact, this uniqueness, we can even see it in, in when babies are born. You know? Some babies, some you see them in, in no time. They show different uniqueness to them, different distinction, different something about them. And of course, <coughs> if you really look and if you really examine, you might see that they have different, distinct characteristics, different from others. You know, in fact, some of those uh, souls even break the um, I don't know the psychological uh, developmental stages, you know? Like we say the child is born and goes through first the undifferentiated matrix, then merging state, then differentiation, then, you know, separation and individuation. And I've seen exactly the opposite. A child is born already in differentiation, is already in separation. By the age of two, they began to go into the merge state, you know? Well, it's, it's, it's very uh, fascinating phenomena, and I've seen it many times. You know, then I realized that different souls come with different kind of qualities. You know, mm -hmm. and one soul come with a lot of heartfulness, one comes with a lot of consciousness or mindfulness, or some kind. Some come with a lot of will. You know, so at least these souls uh, differ in their evolution differ in their journeys, God knows how many lifetimes, millennium, millions of years come and go, learning, and some evolve and some devolve. And the story of the, these souls or these points of light, these individuated selves, I wish someday to know it. It's fascinating, it's more fascinating or as fascinating as the knowledge about the absolute. You know? 
It's like, who are we? What are we doing? You know? So the absolutists resorted to the final realization that the ocean is the alpha and the omega. Hmm. You know? And the fish is left behind not knowing who they are, what they are, what they're doing. We are the fish. We are unique, we are different, we have purposes, you know. And uh, I hope that explains the, the selves, you know, that there is an ego self, the self is conditional, very conditioning. There is an essential self, which is the, the soul, the unique entity that we are, that can exist in all the realms. And there is basic nature of awareness, consciousness, that when you feel it, you feel you're here, but you are undefined. That is the absolute. That is uh, selfhood. So the three selves. Then the three selves, you know, there are also three kinds of consciousness. Consciousness born or generated by these kind of three selves. The worldly self, the ego self, the ego consciousness or this ordinary human consciousness, even though in its true, it's, in its true nature is made of pure awareness, of the absolute, but it is a very limited, confined drop of consciousness, confined by our ego limitation and knowing and knowledge or the lack of. And so this consciousness is very, very um, limited, you know, uh, and very inefficient. This consciousness is, is uh, very flimsy, you know. It, it freaks out if there is something scary, if it, it collapses, if there is something, you know, bad. It, it's, it's not steady. It's not, you know, it's, <laughs> it's shape. It, it, I don't know. It's very flimsy, you know. Uh, it doesn't have stability. But it enables us to see you know, what is there to drive a car, to go to the store, to think about this, think about that. It's a consciousness made of elements of our mind. Then the higher self, you know, the point of light and also the intermediary realm of, us, uh, of the kingdom is ruled by a higher frequency of consciousness. This consciousness is very strong, very precise, very uh, cohesive, uh, able to have a panoramic view as well as a capacity to zoom and focus. This consciousness is what, is what we call objective consciousness. The ego is subjective. If it likes it, it's good. If it doesn't like it, it's bad. This one sees things as they are, objective consciousness. And it is uh, in the essential domain is consciousness made of diamonds, diamonds made of light. Condensed light, when they compress, become diamond, and the diamond uh, awaken a capacity in us as a human being of consciousness. This consciousness uh, enables us to have discriminating wisdom, you know? Uh, to, to, to know what is what, and, you know, uh, what's the use of this and what's the use of that. And this consciousness also can withstand the assault of the fluctuation and um, the different situation we are exposed in, in life. If something grievous is, is happening or something terrifying is happening, this diamond consciousness can sustain the blow of those feelings and emotions and can per be there while the grief is happening or the fear is happening. And that's what the consciousness we use in therapy. So we don't just identify with the emotion and lose objectivity. We can allow the emotion, but also be there. So we are not taken by it and we can uh, explore its nature and its root. This is the diamond consciousness, objective consciousness. And then there is the third consciousness which is, I don't call it consciousness, I call it pure awareness. Consciousness is a lower frequency, in my perception, lower frequency than pure awareness. Pure awareness is a higher consciousness, is a higher frequency, much higher frequency. The, the, that is the awareness of the, that's the awareness of the absolute. 
the absolute is just pure awareness. And pure awareness enables you to perceive things as they are without necessarily the, the objective consciousness. You could have pure awareness with objective consciousness, or you could have awareness without objective consciousness. For example, uh, you can come to, to a room, let's say meeting room, you know, work room and meeting room. And if you are in a pure awareness, you might see chairs set in a certain way, you know, and you might see certain pictures in the wall that has, you know, certain, they seem to be relating to each other a certain way, or you might not even notice they are relating. You just see that pictures on the wall, chairs are around, uh, set in a certain way. You are aware of every color, you are aware of every texture, but you have no idea of what is what. It's just like a baby looking at the world in, in wonderment, in a pure perception. Then if you come a little bit lower from that higher frequency, you begin to see the chair is set in a certain way. And there is, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe certain pictures in the wall that shows spiritual figures or something. Then you begin to figure out that the, the chairs are for people to sit on and they are to be sat on in a different formation that might make a circle. So there's a place for meeting and the pictures pertaining to spiritual or to dancing or to, you know, or uh, this is a disco place. So once you come to the uh, uh, differentiating wisdom, you know, that's the diamond consciousness giving you the meaning of those objects. You know, while pure awareness goes beyond all of that. As such a beauty, such a richness, because everything is glowing, beautifully exquisite. But you don't need to know what's it about. You don't need to differentiate it, this for this and this for that, you know. Yet you can also mix the three. You can have the worldly consciousness to give you knowledge, you have a diamond consciousness to figure out what's it about, you have kind of pure awareness to see the beauty of it as suchness. To, to cultivate this capacity is, to me, is a very beautiful, advanced, evolutionary stage in the journey, you know. You, you, like you thin your ego, you, you make it more tame ego instead of too wild, and the diamond body is not taking over in which you are mostly about conceptualizing or, you know, and it's not pure awareness shining over everything and erasing everything. You, <laughs> you balance all those elements and then you can see the magical kingdom we are living in simultaneously. The relative, the essential and the absolute together. And that requires a lot of balancing of the system, the biochemistry of the system, the cleansing of the nervous system, glandular system, uh, modification of the uh, mind and capacities like that. So uh, these are part of the evolution the human being can go through. So these are the three kind of consciousnesses that we have. You know, worldly consciousness, more deeper consciousness that can differentiate more precisely, and pure awareness. <coughs> then there are three teachings, which is, I think, very important, you know, I think this is where a great deal of confusion takes place because you know some some students have been taught something about the absolute, you know, and they are not taught something about this point of light or this individuated being. And uh, the teaching seems to be contradictory, conflicting. And the student then goes into severe splitting or confusion, or they really don't know how to navigate. And you, you see that confusion is, is, is so, so much everywhere, you know. Uh, it's very few that you, you really get instruction saying, this is instruction for your ego. And this is instruction for your point of light. And this is instruction for your absolute, you know. When you're dealing with the absolute, you deal with this uh, clusters of issues and you, you will be... Uh, entering this realm of perception, but when you come to the point of light, you're dealing with these issues and you, you will be experiencing 
different perception than the absolute, you know, and the ego and so forth. So there are teachings that are about the ego and there's so much about it, whether that is in the general education and the development of humanity, how we raise our children, we can develop better ego, more realistic egos. Our schools can be more in alignment, you know, and also uh, so much in our uh, psychology, you know, new age psychology has come a long way from the old traditional psychology. You know, the, the old tradi traditional psychology saw some pieces and then the new age psychology and then body psychology and all of that came and evolved the picture more and more. And now we are evolving it more and more with infusing it with the spiritual. Mm -hmm. So the psychological and the ego structure ca can be also um, infused with knowledges about those domains. So it doesn't fear them, you know. Here, here we are talking about so, something so mystical, so you know, like before, probably I uh, they'll put me on a they'll nail me or something, and here we are talking about it. You know, mm -hmm. I remember when uh, Shirley MacLaine showed up talking about yoga, it was like blasphemy, you know, in the 60s or something. And now yoga seems to be like, you know, if you don't do it, you are right, you are obsolete, you know, where are you living? <laughs> so things change, the humanity change, the ego changes, the perception changes. So there are teaching about the ego, applicable to the ego, you know, and like, uh, for example, there is need for boundaries and things like that, you know, but for the point of light, you need to let go of the boundaries. For the absolute, you need to let go of even of individuation and boundary, you know. And there are certain things, for example, that uh, in, in, the, in the absolute, for example, uh, you need to let go of all attachments. If you're attached to anything, the state is shrunk. If you let go of any attachment, the state opens up purely. But in order to function, you need attachment. Yes. And you need healthy attachment. And in fact, one of the biggest mistakes I've made in my life, I pray for my children to forgive me. I pray for all the parents that, that hear me. Develop healthy attachment with your children. I try to give them non-attachment. Mm -hmm. I try to go into, oh, let them shine in the absolute and their points <laughs> shine in the absolute. And they needed, you know, even though I gave them love and belonging, but they needed to, for them to develop, you know, all of those structures that can help them, you know, uh, navigate better in life, individuate, um, uh, all of the healthy structure that, that are really needed. So if we say attachment is, is off, is bad, you know, then the children grow like, like sometimes like weeds. They don't, they don't know how to grow, you know. Yeah. They, need, they need boundaries, they need limitation, they need attachment, healthy attachment, belonging, feeling safety, feeling, feeling loved, feeling all of those things, you know. While the non-attachment is, is applicable for freedom, for the absolute, an attachment is needed for healthy psyche and worldly things. So those teachings, we really need to differentiate them. There are teachings about the point of light, you know, and there are teachings about the uh, absolute, you know, and uh, often the absolutist, you know, which if you notice I've been on their case, you know, for some time now. Just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, when when somebody asks them a question, like, you know, somebody, I think I mentioned, asked this high guru about, you know, um, is there life after death? Do I continue, you know? And the guru said, the, pro the problem with this question, the problem with you is that you believe you're going to die. You don't realize the deathless, you know? So yes, the answer is correct, but it's an absolutist answer. It's only one third of an answer, you know? The absolute doesn't die. And if I recognize that it's my nature, I don't live, I don't die. But I'm gonna die. This body gonna die. <laughs> this ego is afraid, you know? It doesn't know how to navigate. The soul is also caught in all kind of, you know, limitations. And it, it's, it doesn't know that it's gonna continue. So instead of the student being guided to the fears of the ego and the bodily 
fears and also to the existing of a soul that continues even after dying, all of that was negated. His anxiety, his need, his vulnerability were all dismissed yeah. as unreal and were guided to the deathless one. You know? And I feel that's not fair. That's not right. You know? So the, the, we cannot answer every question by the absolute. And the absolutist, you can find every question asked to, to, you can take it to the absolute. In fact, you can confuse all your students, no end, you know, <laughs> by showing that their questions are off because it's coming from their conceptual mind. Yeah. It is coming from their conceptual mind. Their conceptual mind is, is, is legitimate, you know, because there are so many things here that need to be addressed. Human vulnerability, the human development, the soul, the evolution. It's not all about the source and the, be, the, the being. You know? That's the basic ground we create from. But how about this magical kingdom that's really so, so awesome, that's manifesting and evolving? We just dismiss it. You know? So they are teaching to, pertaining to the three domains. You know? Well, thank you, Faisal. I, I so appreciate not only your brilliant articulation of uh, three, three, dom three domains, um, but also your, your uh, humility and asking for forgiveness from your children and for anyone who doesn't understand. I just I yes. really appreciate that. Really, my God. I wish I knew, you know, <laughs> now, then what I do now. You know? Even I offered it with utmost love. I think that's what saved them. The love was there, you know, I wanted to give them the best, you know, and I was feeling guilty of developing attachment, their mind, you know, all of those things. You know? and, uh, A little bit too much Zen. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that, you know, when, when my uh, uh, wife was pregnant, you know, I remember one time feeling like I was driving, you know, and she's pregnant, you know, and so I have to be careful how to drive and all. And I was feeling like a lion, you know. If anybody dares mess up with the driving, you know, I, I, I will, you know, I said, what is this? I'm supposed to be, you know, compassionate, loving. I said, no, why are you compassionate, loving? <laughs> I'll show them hell, you know. They better know that there is a pregnant woman here, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a beautiful feeling that came that I, I tried to transcend saying this is ego or this, I should go to this equanimity. I, no, I needed these feelings. These feelings were installed by me, uh, in me by the divine. You know, protection of, the, of life, care for life, wisdom, you know. But just the transcendence and, you know, uh, when my children were born, I remember feeling, would I kill? Yes, I would. Hmm. That failure of total uh, enlightenment and compassion. When I looked at this feeling, I said, wow, so beautiful, this feeling that like a, a lion or a lioness will protect its children, hmm. will defend them. A bird will, will fight, you know, an eagle. Hmm. A little bird will fight an eagle to, to, to protect its children. Yeah. So... In my youthful ignorance and excitement, I wanted to apply the teachings of enlightenment to every domain, and the result was missing so much wisdom, you know, so much wisdom that I was there. So I, I tried to summarize some of those things, you know, about uh, the three domains. Oh, the, 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 there are also another... Uh, uh, the, the three uh, quests, humanity, I have three quests. Okay. One is that I think all of humanity are seeking self. I have never heard anybody who doesn't mention I. You know, I, me, and myself. The Holy Trinity is <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> really, you know. So we are all searching self because we lost it and we want to regain it. It's beautiful. We are also seeking home, our original home, you know? 
and the absolutists, including me at one time, thinking home is the absolute, mm. is only the absolute, you know. Now I see home is this kingdom, this is threefold kingdom, you know. The absolute going into the essential and the essential coming into the um, manifest, this constitutes the kingdom. And if I am only living in one band of it, the material realm, then I am missing the totality of my home. You know? So if, if I awaken to the essential domain, I feel I am enriched more, I am more home. And if I am rooted in also in the absolute and accessing those three domains, then I feel I landed home. You know? Even though when you reach the absolute, you feel home, but not enough. Give it few years, you feel it's not enough. Then you want to integrate, you know? You want to you wanna come to the ultimate dimension. The ultimate dimension, the absolute is the finality of the journey, but not the ultimate dimension. You reach the finality, and then you integrate the totality again. And that's the, to me, is the ultimate king, uh, dimension. That's home. So we all seek self, we seek home, and this human being, uh, is the most amazing among, you know, I mean, no, there are many, many are like that. We are relational. The human being is relational, you know, is a relational being. It's created that way. Yes, you can be a monk, you can live in solitude, you can do whatever. If you are a five, you live in, alone in the mountains, you know. If you are a two, you will have never ending party, you know. You, then, uh, you can choose this or this uh, to, to reach the balance point, to reach the uh, equanimity of all of that is that, that we are created as um, relational being. In fact, the whole universe is relational. There is nothing independent. There is nothing independent. Everything is interdependent, you know, and that's now they're finding it in physics, you know, and even the uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, said uh, many, many people think the word shunyata, they talk about shunyata, which means the void. They think sh shunyata means void and nothingness. He said, no, shunyata means the interrelatedness between all that there is. Mm. There is nothing separate. You know? Everything is interdependent, codependent, and, 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 and everything else. When we realize that there is then love, there is wisdom, there is grace, there is uh, live and live, there is you know harmony, you know all of those things. So these are the three quests: the relatedness, the kingdom we come from, and the uniqueness of, of what we are. The last one is that we have three bodies, you know, not just one body, you know. Uh, we have the physical form, you know, this you can call it body or let's say it's form, right? And this form can be shaped or influenced by different elements. Pain makes it hold itself one way, love makes it, it shape shifts subtly in different ways, you know, molecular structurally it shape, it shape shift. Essential state makes it dif uh, different, even though it maintains the same shape. shape. There is a, a body formulated by the personality. This ego and this personality structure formulate a certain structure in our body. You know, tensions, uh, blockages, contractions, um, negative states, acidity, bitterness, um, crystallizations, states that uh, that are um, calcify and rigidify the human body and in, in new therapy, new age therapy, they call it armoring, body armoring. Mm -hmm. And those armoring now, we know a lot about them and they, we know uh, their formation and we know the content in them we know that there's so much crying maybe held in, around the chest. By opening the chest, crying might flow and love might flow. You, you name it. There are seven bands and seven. It's very fascinating knowledge. So the personality 
blocks the centers of energy and formulate the body stuck in a certain shape, certain form. In fact, if you look at the Enneagram, uh, the nine different personalities, mm -hmm. you can tell their, uh, you know, the fixation by the body, you know. Nine is usually big body, uh, two, three, four are medium body, five, six, seven are thin bodies, you know, wired body. So you can even t tell the fixation from the formation of the body. So there's a body occupying the physical body, you know, giving it a certain form based on personality. Then there is another body, you know, that is not uh, made of the personality, but made of essential uh, qualities. This body is a body of, uh, of utmost preciousness, element made of preciousness, gold and silver and amber and pearls and diamonds and all of those things. It has an essential form. You know, the point of light has a body, is a human body made of beautiful elements like that. But this body that, that uh, relate to the personality, not to the uh, uh, point, but to the form, to the personality structure, is called stupa. I call it stupa. Okay. Stupa is a, it's like a very beautiful design. It's like uh, the, you see it on the top of the church. There is the steeple. Mm -hmm. The steeple is like a form of a stupa. It's like a minaret. The Muslim have a minaret, and the Tibetan have a stupa structure. You know, S-T-U-P-A, it's a very beautiful structure made of gold and jewels and structure. And that is another body. That's the body of, that's the vehicle of, that can occupy the phys physical body, can release the personality body, replace the fear with courage, replace the grief with uh, compassion, replace the sadness with joy, replace the uh, confusion with clarity, with diamond and pearl. It takes the different composition of the personality and replace them with the essential qualities. So you have a body of jewels occupying your physical body. And that is the temple, King Solomon temple. And that uh, this is the... Um, the, the chariot, it's been called the chariot, you know, and, and the Kabbalah, they call it the, what is it, it's the vehicle, Markaba, you know, um, merry-go-round, variety of names for it. You know, this, this, uh, there is a beautiful song, I think they, they, I heard it here, says, swing low, sweet chariot, sweet chariot, take me home. And they talk about the sweet chariot descending, taking the soul back home to the light, you know. And they, they, they think it happens at the moment of dying. Yes, at the moment of dying, this frozen vehicle in our system releases, comes out, and can take the soul, the, take the point of light to the, uh, to the light, to the absolute. This vehicle is the house of the point of light. The, the personality structure is the house of the ego, and this is the house of the point of light. You know? And it's, it's, it's beautiful, breathtaking. It's nature, all the diamond and the jewel that's made of are heartful. They are not mindful, they are not willful. They have will in it, they have mind in it, but all of it, mind and uh, will, are colored by heartfulness. That's why it is known as the uh, heart of enlightenment, the jeweled heart of enlightenment. And in the old time, we called it the diamond heart, but the diamond heart is only one frequency of diamonds, you know, but somebody who likes pearls will call it, will have pearly heart. Somebody who likes gold will call it golden heart. But it is the vehicle that has all of that, crystals, diamonds, pearls, gold, jeweled, made of utmost preciousness, this vehicle. So this is the second body, you know, the essential body. The third body, the absolute itself can be experienced as body. Yeah, I am a body without a body, without a form. Yeah, I am a presence, a fullness that's empty of all concepts. And I feel I am embodied, but nobody without a body here, you know? Uh, 
That's why some friends said, you know, it's not Buddhahood, it's buddyhood. <laughs> so it's, uh, the absolute can be seen as one experience of it, not only self, but also body. Body that has no form, the formless body, you know. But it doesn't mean we negate those two other bodies, because some of the absolute say, oh, there is no body. No, there is. <laughs> there are two more bodies that are very important to consider, to deal with, <coughs> to, to, to embody and to, to integrate, to live the kingdom in its totality, you know. To really uh, always an inspiration to me when the Christ, when the Christ said, uh, I am the Alpha and the Omega and everything in between, of course, you know, and I am the light, that's the point of light. And I am the way, that's the stupa. And I am the truth, that's the absolute. Oh. He said it. You know, when you have the stupa, you feel everything you do is the way. It's the right way. You are the way itself. You know? It's not like you, you, you choose a way to reach home. You are <coughs> home walking. <coughs> and the light, the point of light shines light. You know? I mean, as, to, to integrate the totality of this kingdom, to see how beautiful, how majestic, and to sort out our, under, uh, our you know, knowledges and under, to, to encompass all of that, it brought me huge relief to get the map. This is the view. I'm just presenting the view, the map. There is more to add up to it, you know. Hopefully in other interviews, we get into the nitty gritty, I give examples, intricacies, the issues that are on the way to experience those domains and those qualities, you know. But for now, I just want the, the listener to open their heart and mind and be inspired. They can protest, but be inspired. It's okay, you know. Love it. Thank you so much, Faisal. <laughs>